Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. And hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here to talk about our February 2022 book club pick, Good Talk, by Mira Jacob. And we're joined by a very special guest. I think this is, it's not our first potluck crossover, but it's our first modern minority crossover. Welcome to host a fellow potluck pod of modern minorities, Roman Segal. Hi. Nice to be here. And Quarantine Comics. Right. Yeah. You're, you're a double potluck pod host. <laughs> well, it's, it's great to be here about one of my all-time recent favorite books. Uh, so I feel like I get to read this book once a year, and I may or may not cry every time. So if I cry on this podcast, I <laughs> I apologize. This yeah. is a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is it? <laughs> Yeah, it's a when, safe space where over a thousand people will listen to this episode and wonder why you're crying. But uh, yeah, it's a safe space. Well that, well, that means they don't listen to my other podcasts and cry with me on them. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when Rira suggested that we read this book for February, I immediately thought of you because I remember seeing that this was your favorite book that you featured not on both of your other podcasts as well. So um, definitely, if you want to get the whole Rum and Good Talk <laughs> trilogy, you should definitely check out all of his podcast. <laughs> fun fact, though. So fun fact, I have a third podcast, which is a little more corporate with a nonprofit. And um, we just celebrated our 100th episode. And so the founding co-founding co-host and I, we kind of interviewed each other. And we asked that like favorite book question at the end. And because I'd been reading this, I just had to talk about Good Talk. So Good Talk has now officially come up on every podcast that I've ever been on. So including guest appearances on other shows. So. Wow. I did not realize the Roman good talk trilogy was actually a, an expanded universe yes <laughs> <laughs> well fun fact so fun fact i think this is public knowledge but i will check and you'll have to edit out if it's not good talk <laughs> has been optioned for television so i think we do we cover that or i don't know um it sounds we, familiar we may have it does sound <laughs> familiar but then again we cover so much news in in like the book to film adaptation world so yeah. but i wouldn't be surprised but this book came out in 2018, and man, when I started reading it, I was like, "This is a period piece." Like, I feel like we're <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like so much has changed. But every, everything's better now. Everything's time, better. But at the same time, nothing has changed. <laughs> Are things better? I mean, we're on a precipice of like a global conflict, potentially World War Three. It's bad times right now, and I did check our stats and. We do get occasionally one or two listeners from the Ukraine. So to our Ukraine listener, 
Splash listeners. Um, hope you are staying safe during this conflict. And, you know, hopefully, if you're still listening to us, this podcast will bring you a little bit of comfort as you, you know, go through this tough time. All right. Well, I think we should just dive in. Um, per, the, the, t- the full title of this book is Good Talk, A Memoir in Conversation. And a memoir in conversations is a very accurate description, in my opinion, for the format of this book, because everything is very short. All of the chapters are, I would say, like maybe three, four pages at at most. Yeah, it is a graphic novel. So a lot of the the book is in comic book form. I guess as we get started, Rewa, do you want to start with the, the book jacket description? Inspired by her popular BuzzFeed piece, 37 Difficult Questions from My Mixed Race Son, here are Jacob's responses to her six-year-old son, Zakir, who asks if the new president hates brown boys like him. Uncomfortable relationship advice from her parents, who came to the United States from India one month into their arranged marriage, and the imaginary therapy sessions she has with celebrities, from Bill Murray to Madonna. Jacob also investigates her own past from her memories of being the only non-white fifth grader to win a Daughters of the American Revolution essay contest to how it felt to be a brown-skinned New Yorker on 9-11. As earnest and moving as they are sometimes laugh-out-loud funny, these are the stories that have formed one American life. That's a very NPR. Like, I, I heard that and I was like, that, I mean, I guess that's accurate, but <laughs> it's a very NPR you, kind of review of it versus like... You know how the, book jackets go, you know? Yeah, you but... To, the, you have to hook in, like, the literary... Uh, the, the literati listeners. the literati yeah, the literati <laughs> yeah you can't go in with you're gonna relive the run-up trauma to 2016 election yeah and yeah. all of your feelings um during that like eight month period well i mean but it's so much more than that like it's an emotional gut punch to like and i i can't speak for everyone but for a lot of our lived experience the childhood the teenage the college the relationships the parents the and it's just i i'm sorry like this book it just uh the way we described it uh, every time i write a podcast description and i talk about this is like this this book hits too close to home like that's i don't know and that's a compliment that's the highest compliment it's just like an emotional gut punch every other chapter yeah so i guess um we always start off with general impressions so um Riro, what were your um, overall impressions of the book um i was pretty excited to read it because i've heard so many great things about it and graphic memoirs um you know, I wouldn't say that they're a new genre, but there's definitely been like a recent surge of them, in my opinion. And it's been really it's been really great to see graphic memoirs from um, like Asian Americans and other immigrant and marginalized experiences. A lot of those stories don't really get the mainstream uh, marketing, I guess. So I felt like Good Talk did get a lot of mainstream marketing because I just saw it everywhere and i think mira like she um like posted the first comic like the 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 very opening chapter i think with her son talking about michael jackson and Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. oh is he is he white or black i think she posted that online first and then it went super viral and then that's how uh she ended up like making more comics and compiling them for this book that's I think that's what happened. That's what I kind of read online. But um, overall, I really liked it. I liked how the chapters were very short and digestible. I really liked the art style. I don't know. It just reminded me of like Daria in a way where it's like very minimalistic um, and none of the faces have expressions. It's like all the same. They're paper cuttings. They're actual paper cuttings. Yeah, they're paper cuttings. Yeah, yeah. I know some people were were a little bit weirded out by that on Goodreads, saying like, "Why, why are they saying such serious things with such a straight face?" And I'm like, "Well, this book is about being honest and having difficult conversations." So I like the fact that there were no <laughs> expressions on on the uh, paper cutouts, and there were a lot of things that I could relate to in the book um, as like an Asian American immigrant, also. Uh, being in an interracial relationship with a white partner and uh, you know like i'm not south asian but colorism is definitely a thing Mm -hmm. in east asian culture too so uh there there was a lot in this book it was a lot of like samples 
um, <laughs> if that's like a correct way to put it. A um, trauma, a tra- an emotional trauma, greatest hits. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> emotional. <laughs> yeah, and Roman, this is your. I don't know how many. How many times have you read this book now? We're coming up on five or six because, <laughs> like, I accidentally discovered this at the library. You know, back in 2019, 2018, 2019. And, you know, that's peak Trump era. It was kind of a dark period for us. And I just kind of picked it up. And I don't know. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a father of a young kid. My daughter, who's uh, half Chinese, half Indian, um, she would have been three at the time. And, you know, we were, it was a scary time. It just generally, you know, what's going on in the world. And so to kind of see someone talk about the moment that we're in, but also talk about kind of all the root causes and of her fear and her emotions. Um, it just really resonated. And then obviously, um, you know, when we, when we first reviewed it on quarantine comics, um, my comic book underground comic podcast, my reporter buddy, Ryan, I actually brought Sharon, my modern minorities host on it. And Sharon doesn't read a lot of comics. And, um, you know, we just, it just opens up a lot of conversations and comparisons to kind of what our lived experience was. Even me as a, as a man hearing, Sharon relate to being an Asian woman and kind of the expectations of parents and the kind of double standard against your brother. So I've read this over and over again in different lights. Uh, then when we had the privilege to interview Mira, obviously I read it one more time. And I feel like this is now a book I pick up every year or so. I've gifted this book, God knows how many times as well, to my sister, to white friends even. Um, because I think it's almost disarmingly honest. Like, you're not sure what to expect when you read it because of the quote-unquote simplistic nature of it. It, it. it packs an even harder punch because of it. So, yeah, yeah. And every time something hits me differently. What about you, Marvin? Yeah, I mean, I, I went in not knowing what the book was about, just the general description that it's centered on conversations with uh, Mira's son. And... I mean, the art style was it's just very striking and it reminded me of a visual novel, like because mm-hmm. the art style is just a lot of static characters mm-hmm. on different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But even though the art style is quote unquote simplistic, it allows her to do a lot of really interesting things with how she lays out the text. There's a couple of really beautiful just like spreads throughout the book mm-hmm. as well. You know, reading through, it was really relatable as a diaspora member of American society, right? Um, the constant kind of tension of feeling other, feeling unsafe through the eyes of a child. To like, I think the book is framed, there's like, it's kind of like a dual narrative sort of, right? You have the timeline with the sun, which is present day. Yeah. Yeah. Concurrent with the Trump, you know, nomination and election mm-hmm. 20, in 2016. And then you have, Her story growing up in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, trying to find a career in writing in New York. And a lot of that's super relatable, too. Like, there's that, um, I remember that one spread where it's just all the unsolicited feedback she gets about being a (laughs) South Asian writer in New York. Try majoring in writing in New York and everyone telling you, hey, maybe you should do something else. And it's like, thanks. As if I did not think about that before. (laughs) Why do you think I'm doing writing? It's because it's the only thing I think I'm decent at. Not even and that, but just, I, just the conflicting advice. Like, don't write about ethnic stuff. Definitely capitalize on writing about <laughs> ethnic stuff. <you> know? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm assuming you... Well, first and foremost, like, while this is a graphic memoir, it looks and feels different from many graphic novels and comics. And Mira has said, you know... It was an ex- it was her own self experiment to break into comics, and it's not a world she is from. She is not a sequential artist. She taught herself to do this. She's an acclaimed author for a non graphic novel, right? Her her first novel, Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, it's actually a fictional account that mirrors kind of her life growing up, and so it's so it's almost like the prequel to this book, even though it's not right. Um, and, and I mean, I couldn't help but after reading this book the first time and maybe or maybe not crying, I had to pick up that book to kind of understand and see her execute in the other style. So this this book, Good Talk, is almost an evolution of her kind of want, wanting to try new things and try new mediums and try new storytelling formats to capture those conversations more vividly than maybe prose could. Yeah. Yeah, memo writing is a little bit tricky because uh, you still want to have 
a relationship with the people that you write about in your mm-hmm. memoir. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas if you're writing a fictionalized story that's based on your real life, obviously there's a little bit of distance. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know, there's just like uh, like an organized story, a conclusion. Whereas with Good Talk, it's literally a series of conversations. And there really aren't any easy answers when it comes to growing up as a person of color in America. And it really shows because her son asks really difficult questions. And as a parent, she's like, I don't really know the answer. I thought I would know the answer by the time I grew up, but I guess we're all still growing up. And uh, it, yeah, it was, it was very interesting reading this as someone who did not talk about race with her parents growing up because of the uh, cultural and language barriers. But Obviously, uh, my parents had their own racial prejudices and uh, just like a lot of uh, implicit biases. And I could definitely relate to that while I was reading the book. I don't know about you guys because I don't know your experiences. I mean, so we've read a lot of memoirs uh, for this book club. And I think a lot of times I say the same things every time, which is, you know, even though Mira's experiences aren't exactly similar to mine, right? Like personally, I can't relate to growing up as the only Asian in a neighborhood because I wasn't. I grew up here in the San Gabriel Valley where up until even through college, my schools were always 40 to 50% Asian. Mm. So that feeling of isolation is something that I personally don't feel. But as someone who, you know, exists in America as, you know, a minority person of color, the feeling of, like there's this tension throughout the book that I think you pick up on if you are like a person of color in America, right? Mm-hmm, e- mm-hmm. Like doubly so if you're like a, a dark skinned person of color. And I think that's something that is a hundred percent relatable for a lot of us who exist in this country where, I mean, going back to the whole 2016 election thing, I think framing the book around that point in time is really important because for a lot of us, especially in at least at least my generation, um, which is like the older millennial and younger, that was probably a lot of our first time realizing that like viscerally, there are two countries that we live mm-hmm. in, mm-hmm. right? Um, because this is coming off the tail of the you know the quote unquote Obama era, which you know practically speaking was probably not the promised time that we thought it was, but. To backslide from then to, you know, the Trump era was, like, devastating for a lot of people. Well, I mean, it it shows up in the book, too. I mean, there's this momentous moment. There's kind of two um, present moment tracks that are happening. The run-up to Obama is kind of a series of, or an arc at the end of the book. And the sheer optimism of, like, the New York Times cover that Obama won on top of her baby in the crib. Like, I have hope for this world. and literally. The the trepidation, the cautious optimism, this is going to break our heart when it doesn't happen. We can't let ourselves believe in this. Um, if anything, it, even though you already know Trump will win and you even know how it's going to play out in the book, it it rubs a little salt in the wound to kind of show the hope paying off all the optimism of the moment because we already know from the previous chapter that it just gets taken away. Yeah, and that one chapter where it's, the night of the election and they're having a party. I mean, how many of us were at those parties, right? And watching oh, man. I was, that I was map turn that red. Party. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of tears. And it was it was like really interesting seeing the reactions of like my friends who were not white and then like my white friends. Like my white friends were like very devastated. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe like this <laughs> happened. Like, man, like we need to like you know, protest and do all the stuff. And then like the people of color in the room are just like, oh <laughs> man, like <laughs> it's just like we we didn't want to believe it, but at the same time, like I this is it. kind of the world that we live in every <laughs> single day. It's not like we beat racism after Obama, you know, was was pre- president. So like for us it was kind of like we're we're surprised, but not yeah, it's really like, heartbroken. <laughs> well, there's there's an amazing SNL sketch that shows the night, and 
Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock are the two black friends at the party. And it's that exact moment, right? It's like all all the white cast members at the party are just like devastated. And they're like, yeah, called it. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting, Rira. You talked about um writing a memoir, right? It's kind of a dangerous thing to do. And when we talked to Mira, something she kind of revealed were the kind of people that she had to kind of review this with. And she kind of played back kind of three kind of things. Her son her in-laws, and her husband, right? Because these are people very near and dear to her heart. She loves her in-laws. Like, it is heartbreaking to her because she said it was really easy. It would be easy to paint them as monsters because they're not. They are still in her life. That's why it was so hard for her. Uh, Mira lost her father, so she is very close with her husband, Jed, a a prominent documentarian with, with his parents. And she said when she went back and reread and edited herself of what she said about her in-laws, she had to put it through the filter of, am I doing it for clarity or am I doing it to kind of win an argument and be vindictive? <laughs> right. And, and, and in my mind, that's like, oh shit, there's another edit out there. Right. But she, cause she wanted just to, to expose and be clear on what happened. But then with her son, it was, she needed to read these chapters to her son to make sure he was okay with it because he's, I think uh, Z is now probably 14 now. But he was six or seven when she was making this book. And that's, she really felt the tension of, is this a fair thing? And then with her husband, the, you know, the big argument at the end with her husband, that is like such a true, like married people argument. But she was saying when she was letting her husband read it, and, you know, he's a documentarian, they collaborate a lot. They literally got into the same argument over again about, oh, no. <laughs> about that moment. It's like, it's like that, this one like territory that they can't come and touch like the, the NPR story anymore as a couple. So I, I just thought it was really fascinating to be like, if you're going to put this thing out there in the world about the people you love, what is the accountability? Like, it almost makes me afraid to, I mean, I guess on our podcast, we sometimes talk about our lives, but like to write a book, man, fiction's way easier. The NPR guy sucked though. I hope he knows what <laughs> <Yeah>. he did. <laughs> yeah. Fuck that guy. <laughs> Can I say that on this podcast? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that was like one of my uh, favorite chapters in the book, where, <laughs> like, with the email exchanges with the with the interviewer and and like the fight that she has with her husband. Indian uh, Asian. That's a term, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, what? Like, I've never heard that term before. And it's such <laughs> like, a. I mean, not to paint all NPR people in the same brush, but such like a like a East Coast like elite like point of view. Say no, this term is the most neutral and fair to all i mean what what made me like kind of lose my mind was the editor saying oh can we like change the names of your characters because they'll be like hard for our listeners to i don't know to like pronounce the names or to understand like like they're different people and i'm like what like that yeah. you're asking a <laughs> novelist to change her character name like why would you ask that that is such like a betrayal, I think, when it comes to like, in- yeah, it was it was just bizarre. Yeah, can you can you, can you yeah. talk down to our listeners, please? Right, like, <laughs> yeah. And when you think about it, I mean, this happened within the last decade, right? Like I said, it feels feels like a period piece. It feels like a different era, but at the same time, I, not much has changed. Yeah, I was gonna say that's where I disagree with you. Like this this book, even though it talks about you know growing up in Trump and Obama's America, like there's so many truths that are still true. And the um, this book, like I, I think a lot about work like this. It's it's great that we're all Asian and we're reading this and we're all high fiving and patting ourselves on the back that oh we felt this this is experience. But like I need. I, I need people's majority brains to read this as I read this book as a man to understand things I don't understand, right? Like I have an older sister and I totally get the double standard that I lived against her with my parents, with how Mira and Arun live. Like, um, so it's just like, this is very opening for our kind of majority brains. And, um, I think that's who needs to be reading it. And you need to come at it from your majority experience. Yeah. Because I feel like, and I think that's that's a challenge, right? That's why, you know, when when whenever we put out lists about here's what she whenever something shitty happens and we put out those lists of books you should read to be more empathetic, we worry, are we just preaching the choir? Because are, are the people who actually need to read this book gonna read this book? Are they gonna get what we hope they'll get without being defensive? Because I think about that one chapter with um 
Brie, was it? The Oh man, the uh the person who hired her. Right? Yeah, and that like when I was reading that chapter, I was so uncomfortable because we've all been in that I mean, I don't know if we've all been in a position, but I'm sure a lot of us who who do creative work have been in that position where we really need the money, but man, this person sucks. <laughs> But that's universal. It's not. I mean, it, the, the way Mira writes it is as a minority experiencing the moment. But I mean, but there's some, you know, and that's the beauty of, of good writing. Like there's things we can all cringe to that together, maybe for different reasons. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, that chapter ends with that beautiful like writing on like, I think it was either a sky or a building saying, you know, um, I didn't see you either. Uh, I didn't even try, which I, I'll push back in saying, no, she didn't see you first. It's not your job <laughs> to do emotional labor for the microaggressor, okay? No, Mira's trying to be the, the bigger person here. I thought it was interesting to read this book in a time where um, schools and parents are protesting against like critical race theory being taught in their classrooms and all of the book bans that have been happening recently. And... With with the book bans, it's just it's just been really weird because because a lot of the choices that that they've made to ban certain books have just been so it, it's such a bullshit reason. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the like, reason is it it makes me feel bad to be white. That's the reason to ban all of the books. That yeah, it, it's it's not it's not like the video games that our parents were like clenching their pearls for. Like when, like it's not Mortal Kombat bad <laughs> shit. It's it really isn't. Like and I've read. Almost all of these books and comics that are being banned right now, be it gender, queer, or mouse, it's it's kind of nuts. Like it's like <laughs> at least be a little more subtle about your book banning racism. <laughs> like, but that's the thing. Like after 2016, like the like the subtle racism just like came out. Like as soon as Trump became president, I feel like the inner racists were just like, yeah, I have permission to have my racist thoughts out there because now i have like now we have a president who is saying all these crazy things and yeah so with like the book bans i i'm just like these parents are saying i don't want my white child to feel bad about being white i don't want other classmates who are not white to blame my child for making their life miserable and I'm like, that's not what critical race theory is. And in, in, par- in parallel, though, they're fighting for their freedom to not have to wear a mask. You know, so freedom, yeah, freedom, yeah, freedom actually. applies selectively. <laughs> but it's just heartbreaking because, um, like, a lot of these, like, kids from marginalized backgrounds, like, they don't get their parents to shelter them from the experiences that will you know, shape them, the trauma that will shape them. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, we're trying to teach empathy to our kids, right? That's the goal. But you're not extending the same level of protection. So, yeah, I thought it was an interesting point. What's so interesting, though, about the book bans is, you know, book bans might have been effective in the 80s when you had to go to the library and get an encyclopedia and blah, blah, blah. Like, if anything, the book bans have helped with, the, like, the marketing of these books. It's yeah. not just liberals. It's like, oh, shit, you don't want me to read this? Oh, I'm not allowed to go see The Matrix? I'll buy a ticket for as good as it gets, and then I will go see The Matrix. Like, come on. Like, kids are going to find it. But what is frustrating is kids aren't going to be able to discover it. They're going to have to seek it out. Um, but if anything, it, it does kind of raise the profile of these books. Like, Gender Queer is a really important book that, you know, should be read mouse don't even get me started right like oh my god yeah with with mouse i was just like what why (laughs) why (laughs) but like with like with a lot of those kids though who live in like poor urban neighborhoods Mm. where there are no bookstores where the library is not walking distance and your teachers are you know prohibited from teaching these books it's like where are they going to get answers to a lot of the questions that they have about race in america right they just need to worry about that sign from the great gatsby or whatever Faulkner was writing in in (laughs) sound of thunder (laughs) Uh, all right speaking of childhood traumas um the other half of the book of this of the narrative that we haven't touched on as much is the story of Mira's childhood and I guess young adulthood leading up to, you know, finding 
love and getting married. Being the only brown kid suck. I, I, I'll <laughs> say that as a brown kid from Alabama. Like, I just related so hard to it. Like, and like, I mean, I think the one chapter we want to talk about, right, is the um, the essay contest one, right? Like, where she has this hard ass teacher who is just a hard ass, but she, you know, is pleased with Mira's writing and Mira wins this award and gets the ability to go speak in an event. And, but the, what's brilliant about the chapter is nothing is ever explicitly stated. You see that entire chapter through the eyes of a little girl <laughs> and you feel the pain as an adult reading the story. It's something Mira at the time didn't know was wrong. And I, I, I'm pretty sure you guys have those experiences, right? Like when you were a kid, you didn't realize what was going on. And, and most of those memories are kind of gone and cloudy and they come back every once in a while, but you're like, oh shit, that happened? And that was the reason? Like, um, yeah, I mean, it's that kind of awoke a lot of stuff in me. Like kind of when you're living in racism, you're kind of living in water and you don't know what's around you, if that makes sense. You're kind of like a fish in water. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, um, like I mentioned, I didn't grow up amongst, I mean, Let's face it, we all grew up amongst racism. We grew up in this country. Yeah. Um, but like explicitly, I didn't actually encounter explicit racism until I moved to um to DC for grad school. Um, because mm. it was the first time where I actually felt like a minority. Yeah. And also like when you're surrounded by people who don't share the same experiences as you, you're kind of expected to educate them like all the time oh, and the emotional labor <laughs> that comes with it. And you know, for like a lot of a lot of like good intention white friends, you know, they think that they are, you know, being progressive and asking the right questions. And it's just like, but it's at the same time, it is very exhausting. And there are like no matter how liberal there are, there's gonna be boundaries where they won't understand the cultural context. And you see that with Mira. And her in-laws, as well as her husband, um, that scene where, like, she's going to the dog's bar mitzvah. And bark, bark, bark mitzvah. <laughs> bark mitzvah, yeah. She goes to the bark mitzvah, and, like, two of the neighbor neighbors or friends who, who are there, they think that she is a servant. She's, like, she's the help. She's the help, yeah. And I'm like, what? Like, one, she's pregnant. Like, why, like, why are you making a pregnant woman, like, do work that you can easily do, like throwing away your plate into the sink? But, like, what was really cringe, cringy for me in that chapter was her mom, her mother-in-law saying, oh, that can't be, that can't be right. Like, mm -hmm. you're mistaken. And it's like, how many times have we been told that we're crazy and we're like, and it's just like we're not crazy. This is our life. We live through all of these microaggressions, but uh, the majority cannot see it. And I don't know. It, it it feels like a little bit of gaslighting in a way. It's like, am I overreacting? Am I just making this a race thing? But it's, I don't know. Like it, in the end, I was just like, yeah. Well, that's a conversation that's not fun to have after <laughs> after you're proven right. I mean, what do you call? unintentional gaslighting i guess it's just erasure right it's just you know just ignorance but but, but here's what's interesting so at, I, around the same time in the book we're parallel path to a story of mira's youth at prom with her boyfriend right like and so i think it's really easy to point fingers and i think some of us are more guilty than others depending on your life experience but mira was just as guilty of it you know at a point in her life and and she wasn't aware of it. And I think it's about what are those moments, those uncomfortable moments that you have to force yourself into to learn from. And this is, you know, it is exhausting to have to explain it to other people, Rira, which this is where fiction and nonfiction are great. This is where media is great. Because, again, it's great to be talking with other Asian people about this book. But this is a book like, hey, listeners to this podcast, if you are Asian, Sure, get it from the library, but buy a copy of this book for your white friends that you don't want to have a conversation with, right? <laughs> like that's, um, and I and like I modern minorities. My podcast. I have a lot of my white friends from Alabama who listen to the podcast, and I get notes from them. Like I never realized. I was like, well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't have time to explain it to you. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> Rate it five stars on Apple, please. I did 
find it um i mean as diaspora asians let's say we really do get it from both sides right because we get the the racism from the country we live in but then we also get like the not um, american enough yeah, yeah the exclusion from our family back home that coupled with you know mira being a darker skin you know desi person uh like the colorism part was just i mean like we were mentioned like we we have that in the east asian diaspora too and I mean, it's even more egregious there because, like, what's considered dark for us is not really that dark <laughs> in the whole grand scheme of things, right? I didn't. I didn't. My co-host Sharon, when we reviewed this book on um, quarantine comics, she revealed to me that she is a dark-skinned Asian. I was like, really? <laughs> like, okay. But and and she gets that from her family. That's nuts to me. But you know, yeah. Mira talks about you know when she's in America, she's just another brown person. But in India, she's black. Yeah. I mean, and like, you know, skin whitening um, fair and products lovely. are just. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fair and lovely. Yeah. Is that, a, do you guys have, what's, what's the, you guys have SK2? Like, what do you guys have? Oh, that's bougie. <laughs> that's the bougie one. Oh, that's, I know. <laughs> that's all I know about Korean skincare products is SK2 is like the, the Ferrari of skincare. <laughs> it's made from Patera, I hear. Anyway. Like, when, when, like, I see Korean skincare products where they say whitening. I don't really consider it to be skin bleaching because it's not, it doesn't have the chemicals to actually lighten your skin. When they say whiten, they mean brighten, meaning turning your dull, like unexfoliated skin into something more dewy and shiny. But the marketing is there because they're like, oh, everybody wants to be like, beautiful and and like fair and it's like well i mean if that's gonna sell your product sure but that's not that's not what it is but um fair and lovely it it actually is like a skin bleaching product and um yeah it was kind of heartbreaking to read that part because i had i had a uh, an indian american roommate in college and she is a darker um indian american which i was just like you're not that dark. I don't know why <laughs> your family is so like, like, I don't know, so up your ass about this. But her sister is very, very fair. So growing up, she got a lot of um, like negative comments about, oh, you're never going to be able to find a husband. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, what if I never want to get married? And they're like, well, you're crazy. That's not something that, you know, women should be able to do. You need to have uh, you need to have a husband, not just mm -hmm. any kind of husband, a husband who's like from the same background as you. And it's just like, it's the same in East Asian culture as well. It's just, yeah. <laughs> I think as you get older, your parents' expectations just get lower and lower because they're like, <laughs> hurry up. I also really enjoyed that one chapter where the whole entire family just like, moves too fast on this blind date that she gets the set, set up the setup <laughs> with the neurosurgeon <laughs> and i actually had a friend who uh, made the mistake of telling her parents that she was going on a date with somebody and they like they went straight to so when are you getting married before mm -hmm. they even had their first date yeah no i mean um uh, i have dated indian girls in my past before being married and a parent and all that stuff and it's so crazy how fast your family goes to that when it's someone of your culture, right? Um, there's, a, you know, I have a lot of family in Southern California and my elder sister when she wasn't married and she would come visit. Like that exact story with the neurosurgeon has happened to my sister in Southern California. And it is just nuts. It's just like bat shit. It's, it's funny because it's true. You know, it hurts because it's true. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why we don't tell our parents anything because all of a sudden our aunties know and then our grandparents know, <laughs> and then we're getting texts from everybody. Um, but you know, there's a happy ending to this story, uh, and I mean, the world still sucks. <laughs> Spoiler alert! But it's you know, it's uh, something about this book makes me cry differently every time I read it. And um, you know, the resolution with her son, the hope for her son, you know, even the 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 kind of envisioning of her son, the moment with the neurosurgeon, she's afraid I'm not going to have a son. The dreams of her son before Obama is born, but. Obviously, this whole book is a narrative and conversation mostly with her son, but the final letter to her son, you know, that was written when he was much younger than he is today. Um, it re as a parent, it just reads really true on kind of what your hopes are. I can't solve this. I, I don't have all the answers. 
this is the world you're going to inherit. Like, um, I, it gets it gets me every time. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, to me, it was it was very like I did feel the emotion and I did feel the hope and kind of the despair is not the right word, but the helplessness of not being able to provide all the answers that she wants. I'm sure if I were a parent, it would be again doubly effective. <laughs> <laughs> the world right now is kind of like the problems didn't get solved with the 2020 election, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Things are still, I mean, there are things that are out of our control right mm -hmm. now, like outside of the United States. So it's a wild time to be a parent. Uh, I, I, my sympathies to you, Ramin, <laughs> for having to raise. I mean, know? but no, it's, uh, but when shit gets really down, it, it's kind of, it's a double-edged sword i guess is what i would say you know my daughter asks what i'm scared of and i'm scared of anything happening to her yeah. it's the only thing that's that's the only thing that scares me these days because i can't afford to be scared about the other stuff anymore i have to have hope and at the end of a shitty day at the end of a shitty news cycle or a shitty thing happening in our life that like the things that happen to mira I get to read her a book and i get to make sure she's better i get to make sure the kids in her classroom are better because we make sure they know about Chinese New Year's in Diwali, right? It's um, it, it really is. It's two. It's two sides of the coin. I feel like this proactive nature with my child as well. Beyond the, because what's the other option? The other option is, I I, I can't afford to be upset about this stuff. You know, like we have to persevere. And I, it really makes me being a parent makes me reflect on my parents. Like, I, Rira, I think you opened with this at the beginning of the episode. Like. Our parents didn't have time to deal with this shit. They had to put food on the table. They had to raise these little brats who were so hungry and needed shit all the time and, you know, needed to learn stuff. So, um, you know, that, that's why, that's why we, that's why we keep going, man. Yeah. I feel like with, with my parents, um, it, it's so sad. I feel like they had this optimism of, <laughs> of like our child is being raised in America and she's going to be able to speak English without an accent. So she will be able to pass as an American. Like, and have a podcast. <laughs> assimilate enough to a point where like racism isn't going to happen to her. And like as a, like as a child, I knew that they had this optimism and I really couldn't break it to them being like oh <laughs> because like you would explain like some something your classmate said or some like racist adult would say and you're just like well they said this and your parents are like well what does that mean like why are they saying that you're from north korea that's so like do they not know geography and it's just <laughs> like <laughs> i mean it's funny like thinking about it now, but uh, but it's just like, yeah, my classmates know geography. They're just saying that because they're they're mean. And that's, you know, that's something that I really couldn't say as a kid or explain because they didn't have the vocabulary or the experience to um, frame it for them. And yeah, I, I think that's just like the story of children of immigrants, you know, like once you go through it yourself, you think that you're you're going to be equipped to to like pass on that wisdom to your children but at the same time it's like well the world is changing the way people are being racist is changing language is changing how do you protect your children from that and no one really knows the answer i don't think you protect them from it though i think you equip them Does equip that make them, sense? Yeah. because to your point it's changing the things we experienced are not the things our the next generation will experience so they need to learn skills and mechanisms to learn and to adapt. That's more important than any, and how to be a good person and, and have grace in the face of all this shit. Um, <laughs> that's more important. Like, I, honestly, like, as shitty as Mira had it, as shitty as I had it, as shitty as you guys had it, like, it made me who I am. Like, those scars are, <laughs> I'm not saying I enjoyed them, but I'm not saying I, I wish them on people, but they made me who I am. They gave me the empathy and the understanding. Um, but again, there are some people in this world, <clears throat> the last president, who clearly had some bad shit happen to them and it went the other way, you know? But um, yeah, I, I think it's all about equipping. It's not about protecting. You protect as best you can. You put a roof over their head. You know, you don't do stupid shit. Um, but other than that, and, and I think that's kind of the conversations Mira had with her son. It's that too. I'm going to answer these questions as best and as honestly as I can. 
and then I'm going to debrief with my husband about it, and we're going to come up with a plan. <laughs> yeah, and to your point, I think, you know, equipping not only our children, our children, but also, like, just everyone around. Like, like you said, giving this book to people that you think should read it to understand, like, here's one example of what growing up brown in this country feels like. This is what having a child who you know is going to go through similar experiences feels like and you know i I remember just her depictions of her fights with her husband and a lot of it is just that conflict of like her child looks like her and so like she kind of understands what kind of world awaits him right Mm -hmm. and how the world will see him is dad afraid of me yeah Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) it's just like (laughs) i mean i i had a i had a girlfriend and um in college, a serious girlfriend, and she was white, and we had this debate. Like, we weren't going to get married, but if she's like, if I had kids, I can't be walking through the mall and people not think it's my kid. My sister, uh, as well as my podcast co-host, both married to black men. Their children look black. You know, my daughter. It's my daughter's. I'm not sure if she looks Indian or Chinese, but it's it's a thing. You know, and Mira's son looks like Mira, not like Jed. Um, and never mind the kind of relationship. I mean, he is absolutely his father's son. I would imagine. But he doesn't look like it, right? And the world is going to judge him on, uh, you know, a term I've learned on modern minorities is this idea of black passing, white passing, brown passing, you know, like, that's a thing. The world, Obama is a black president, but he's half white, right? So. Yeah. Oh, just reminded of just the fact that we could have had a, in America that, would have been more accepting but we decided to go another way and i mean it's not like america wasn't racist to begin with i mean look (laughs) at our history look at the founding fathers look at the civil war look at every conflict we've been in overseas baked into our history but yeah like like the comments that i get from my family sometimes because they're they still haven't given up the hope of oh we're gonna have grandchildren from you (laughs) <laughs> but it's like, well, your your partner is white and you're Asian, so you're gonna have like the most beautiful kids because mixed race children are beautiful. And I'm they like, are. wow, that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to like, what am I supposed to respond <laughs> to with that? But, um, yeah, just like people think that being in an interracial relationship. And having mixed race children, it's like, yay, we defeated racism. Everyone is beige. Everything is great. (laughs) And this is a fantasy world where we've beaten racism. But it's not the case. There's a lot, there's a lot of baggage that comes with it. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of conversations that have to happen. And of course, fights. And Mm -hmm. some Mm -hmm. of those fights will never get settled. (laughs) So um, yeah, all of all of that was very real, and <laughs> I think it pointed out a lot of um, – they're good icebreakers, I think. <laughs> like, reading this book, if you're not Asian, like, you – like, I, I feel like we kind of covered it already, but it's like, here's the sampler plate of all of our <laughs> trauma. <laughs> I mean, this book digs up shit, doesn't it, guys? Like, it yeah, really – Yeah, it does, it does. Um. Yeah. All right. Well, as we wrap up our discussion, um, any last thoughts about a good talk by Mira Jacob? Buy it for your white uncle for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> See, as someone who used to work at a bookstore and and like when all the white people were like, we need to buy copies of Stamped. Like we need to make sure that all of the um, books about educating yourself on anti-blackness is is like a New York Times bestseller. The thing is, these people buy these books and they just leave it on their bookshelf. And there were people who went to go buy this book at my local bookstore, but we sold out. And then they would get irritated that we sold out. And they'll be like, well, like, I guess I'll have to just buy it on Amazon. And it's like, well, it seems like you're doing this for clout and not so much of understanding what black people are going through in this country well but this is where this book is the evil genius of this book and the i say the evil genius of like pop culture right it's this is more for the masses friendly 
you know, it, it's a bunch of Instagram posts turned into a, a beautiful graphic narrative. It, it goes down easier. It's funny. Like it, it's wrapped in a, in a bubble of humor, right? Like, um, and so I think that's where a book like this, there's films and TV shows that can do that well. Um, you know, never have I ever is, you know, there, there's, if I had to say as a South Asian, kind of like the three key pieces of literature uh, in this order uh, of release, not necessarily in excellence, but you know, the namesake, this book, Good Talk, and Never Have I Ever on Netflix. Like, you want to understand the Brown experience in America? There you go. Done. And they're <laughs> all kind of fun. And they're all kind of entertaining. So, you know. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't love Asian parent shenanigans? Source of trauma, but also source of levity, because we can all relate to <laughs> our parents being batshit about things that we don't understand. <laughs> but but the, but all of these things um, are important. It, it's 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 all good and fine for us to high five but it's more important for these things to catch on and in the culture beyond you know it's not about brown people reading this and laughing at it 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 really isn't um and i think those things happen with and those those things pieces of the culture do happen with queer america black america asian america etc and i think finding entertaining ways to get the story out there to get buzz to get people talking about i think are important because you read this and then you want to go read the next thing hopefully yeah all right on that note that'll do it for our discussion of good talk by mayor jacob uh once again thank you to Raman for joining us on his fifth reading of the book thank you thank you for the trauma thank you for the trauma oh no problem i have a question though have you have you read this book with the audiobook because i heard that it was narrated by the author i i haven't uh wow okay i guess that's reading number six yeah reading I mean, numbers <laughs> but, but comic comic books is an audiobook i'm not sure how i feel about that you know uh, i'll give it a go i think it's one a, of those experiences where you have to like have both like have the physical copy and then listen yeah. to it as you're mm. as you're reading mm-hmm. which i do quite often I, I don't know about you marvin but it just helps me immerse in the story a lot better sometimes i feel like sometimes audiobooks read too slowly so i need to Bump it up to oh like no! 1. You have to 8. speed it up. Yeah. Like oh, I read my up. audiobooks at like double speed. What are you? <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, all right. Um, on that note, uh, Rira, what are we reading for the month of March? We are reading "Light from Uncommon Stars" by Rika Aoki. It's a sci-fi adventure set in California San Gabriel Valley, and it has cursed violins and queer alien courtship over fresh made donuts so i've heard a lot of great things about this book some of our book club members have already read it and i'm really excited to read it yeah aliens and faustian um deals plus violins it's everything we could ever want from a an asian american <laughs> sci-fi fantasy um novel and yeah um once again Raman, thank you for joining us on books and boba um if people want to find out more of your thoughts and if people want to listen to more of your thoughts um tell us about your podcast yeah, absolutely. Um, so Modern Minorities, if you go to modmypod.com or look it up on anywhere you get your podcast, weekly conversations on race and gender, um, generating more empathy and understanding for all of our majority brains. There's actually an episode where we've interviewed Mira Jacob. Um, and then my other secret underground comic book book club podcast, uh, Qu- Quarantine Comics, qtdcomics.com. <laughs> every week that we we do kind of exactly what you're doing but we do it in comic book form uh so set phasers to fun from from alan moore to uzumaki and everything in between quarantine comics and modern minorities definitely check them out and there's some good talk and more mira jacob conversation on this as well yeah all right um well that'll do it for our discussion of our february book um thanks to everyone for joining us once again <laughs> yeah we'll see y'all next time on book sam boba thanks everyone right, bye Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian-American-hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. 
Learn more about The Collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>